All right, it is the top of the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bernadette Lim. I'm the program manager of the telehealth immersion program here at the AMA. And today is our last session of the year and a, a mini boot camp focused on what's next for telehealth. I'll start off by sharing some program highlights from this past year and then share more on what's to come in the new year around programming. Today, um, I'm joined by my colleagues, Kim and Sandy from our AMA advocacy team who will share key telehealth policy changes for 2022. And then today we've got four physicians that are participants in the program who will share how telehealth is working at their organizations. Dr. Adrian Villarreal, Dr. David Welsh, Dr. Corey Howard, and Dr. Drummel Shaw. And then it is our privilege and pleasure to have Dr. Armstrong joining us today, who will wrap up today's event with closing remarks. Um, just a housekeeping note on the front end, um, this program today is designed to be as interactive as possible. Um, so if you've got a question, please feel free uh, to use the chat. Um, and then we also welcome you to ask your question live after each of the presenters. So if you're interested in doing that, um, feel free to use the raise hand function. Um, and we'll call on you during the Q&A portion. Next slide. Since launching the program in May, um, we've held 13 live virtual events to date. This included six webinars, three clinical case study sessions, three um, or two virtual discussions and two mini boot camps, including this one. Um, we've engaged over 2000 participants um, in this year, which is just amazing. And we just wanted to take a moment here to thank each and every one of you for your participation. We hope that the content we've developed thus far has been helpful to you as you continue to navigate the environment that's rapidly changing around telehealth. And um, really the goal of this program is to support you in your practice. So if there's anything um, that you think would be helpful, we invite you to contact us directly. Um, you can email us at digital.health at ama-assn.org. Um, and we'll absolutely take that into consideration as we design and develop content for the future. Um, in case you have maybe missed some of these sessions or interested in rewatching or sharing, um, these are all available online. You can locate them on our program webpage as well as our AMA YouTube channel. This slide here shows all of our program collaborators that have joined to date. In total, we have 24 participating organizations and look forward to continuing to grow this list in 2022. I just wanted to take a moment here um, to just say thank you to each of the organizations on this slide. Without them, this program truly would not be possible. They have contributed in many ways uh, to the program development, including identifying the identification of topics and speakers and co-hosting events. And we're looking forward very much to working with each of you in the new year. This slide here um, is a bit of an eyesore, but essentially I wanted to share um, just how the curriculum has grown over the past couple of years. In black is content that we added to the curriculum in 2020. In orange indicates content that we added um, just this past year in 2021 and red indicates content that we plan to add in the new year. Um, overall, from a high level perspective, um, you'll see that we plan to add events across each of the six content topical areas. Um, and some of our primary goals are to expand the program curriculum to include events led by our collaborators that are state and specialty specific. We'll continue to add timely and relevant topics to keep you appraised of important policy and payment changes. And we'll pr prioritize the development of additional peer-to-peer -peer case study sessions. So from this past year, we really recognize that there's a op huge opportunity to identify clinical best practices for telehealth. And you know, this continues to evolve over time with the ongoing advancements in research and technology. We piloted three clinical case study sessions this past year, uh, mental behavioral health, primary care, and hypertension. And we'll mainly focus on ad adding additional clinical case studies um, on specialty or use cases next year. Um, some of the topic areas will include allergy and immunology, emergency medicine, neurology, senior care, and addiction medicine. And again, if you've got um, ideas for topics or are interested in participating as a speaker, um, please reach out, reach out directly to us and um, we'd love to talk to you. As registration for each of these events becomes available, just like we've done this past year, um, all of that will be made available on our website and um, you'll also re be receiving email via email um, if you're participating in any of the events. Our first event in January um, is a website manner strategies to make the virtual, the virtual visit a success. 
This session will be presented by Dr. Sakamoto, a primary care virtualist and clinical informatics physician champion at Sutter Health. And he'll be joined by Sarah Krug, CEO and founder of Health Collaboratory, a global innovation hub that's focused on cultivating trust in healthcare and advancing health equity by amplifying the voices of physicians, care partners, and healthcare professionals in the design, development, and continuous improvement of healthcare innovations. We invite you to save the date for this event, which will take place on January 26th from 12 to 1, and registration again will be made available on our website. Lastly here, um, as a reminder, if you haven't already, we invite you to take the AMA Telehealth Youth Survey that's currently in the field. This survey should take about um, 10 to 15 minutes to complete, and the findings will be used to inform the future of telehealth research and advocacy efforts on a state, specialty, and national level. So we really, really encourage you to take this if you haven't already. This will really help us ensure that telehealth is possible in the future. Um, we'll be, the, tele the survey is, is open right now and we'll keep it open through the end of the year. And up on the screen is a QR code that you can scan using your phone camera. Um, and we just thank you all in advance for, for taking this and for supporting our efforts. And with that, um, I will turn it over to you, Sandy and Kim. Great, thanks so much, Bernadette. Um, so my name is Kim Horvath. I'm a senior legislative attorney in the Advocacy Resource Center. And um, I'm gonna take a moment and then, and then Sandy will, will, will follow me, but um, I'm gonna start talking about the state um, landscape when it comes to telehealth. Um, so next slide, please. And I'm gonna start off, I know we're gonna talk about what's heading into 2022, but wanted to take just a moment to kind of lay the groundwork and, and, and let everybody know what happened this past year at the state level in terms of state legislative activity and telehealth. And um, I would break down what we saw really into five key areas. First off, coverage. Um, prior to the pandemic, there were about 30 states um, and, and I should step back and say most of what I'm going to talk about is focused on um, state regulated plans, not necessarily Medicaid programs, which, um, which of course are also um, at the state level. So we're talking about um, state regulated plans. Um, so coverage. So prior to the pandemic, about 30 states had coverage parity laws in place. And this meant that health plans um, needed to provide coverage of services provided via telehealth. Um, on the same basis that they provide coverage for those same services in person. This year, about five more states enacted legislation to remove any remaining barriers and or require coverage for the same um, services provided um, in person. We also saw lots of states um, expand coverage to include audio-only telehealth. And while lots of states simply added audio-only to their definition of telehealth or telemedicine, or extended coverage um, to telehealth services appropriately provided via audio only. Many states um, only allowed audio only in certain circumstances. So for example, some states limited it to certain services like behavioral health services, mental health services, or substance use disorder. Some limited only audio only to only established patients. Some states only limit, limited audio only um, when audio visual was not available. And some states kind of did a combination of the three of those. On payment, we saw about a dozen states enact legislation requiring plans to pay for services provided via telehealth at the same rate or equivalent um, for the same or equivalent service provided in person. And here again, we saw lots of variations among the states. Some of them limited um, these payment policies to certain types of services, such as mental health, Many are limited in duration, um, ending in a year or two, giving states some time to kind of study what this means. And for those states that expanded coverage to include audio only, some of these states set different rates for telehealth provided via audio visual versus telehealth provided via audio only. And finally, we saw a number of states enact legislation to address other payer policies. So things like prohibiting health plans from limiting telehealth coverage to select telehealth only providers and about six states enacted legislation um, in this this year. And finally, we saw about four states enact legislation prohibiting plans from using telehealth only networks to meet network adequacy requirements. We have a mid-year legislative review which provides a full summary of state telehealth activity which I'm happy to drop into the chat um, for those that might be interested. 
Um, so next slide, please. So that was 2021. What should states be thinking about moving forward? And we have some ideas and we'll be working with interested state medical associations and national specialty societies in the coming year on many of these. First off, any remaining barriers to coverage such as origina originating site restrictions or geographic restri restrictions need to be removed, um, full stop. Um, second, we need to advocate for policies that support the full integration of telehealth into physician practices and the shift toward hybrid care where telehealth is just one more tool used by physicians to improve the overall quality of patient care, um, supporting the continuity of patient care and the patient physician relationship. Legislation on telehealth, including payer policies, need to recognize and support this transformational shift that you all know very well. And this includes making sure that all physicians who are part of a broader network are able to provide telehealth services to their patients. Um, it also includes eliminating payer policies that incent care away from a patient's regular physician, like those that might impose different copay levels for care provided to select corporate telehealth providers, um, versus a patient's regular physician, and those policies that might um, have create a separate telehealth-only network. We also believe that network adequacy requirements need to ensure that all patients continue to have access to care in person um, as needed. And, and you all know very well that, that not all services can be provided via telehealth. And it's imperative that patients have access to care in person when it is appropriate and, and, and oftentimes just because this is what the patients prefer and that we wanna make sure that there's not additional barriers, um, hurdles or costs to a patient for, for, choosing, um, for choosing that in-person care. Um, next slide, please. I already mentioned cost sharing, um, so we'll go on to fair payment. Um, when looking at potential barriers to telehealth um, um, moving forward, uh, payment was definitely identified by physicians as a leading concern um, for as, as far as a challenge um, in continuing to be able to provide access to telehealth services. Um, the AMA believes that payment should be fair and equitable for services provided via telehealth, um, recognizing really that coding and payment policies are evolving and catching up to the full umbrella of digital health and telehealth services available. About 25 states now have pretty strong telehealth, uh, uh, sorry, a pretty strong uh, payment policy in terms of telehealth reimbursement. And while um, I think what, what we kind of try to stress is there are um, potential savings and cost savings to telehealth, but those savings should not come from payment reductions to physicians who are simultaneously investing um, in, in implementing and in bringing telehealth to their practices. We recognize, however, that more work needs to be done in this area and more data needs to be um, collected to um, support these payment policies. Also looking at expanding acceptable modalities to include audio only, um, and again, important when clinically appropriate to, um, for the care sought. Um, AMA policy has long supported remote physiological monitoring, store and forward, um, and audio visual, as well as modalities um, as part of telehealth services. Next slide, please. Turning to equity and telehealth, we are really at an important moment in time in adopting the future of telehealth policy. Um, based on data on telehealth utilization over the past 18, 20 months, we um, are very cognizant here at the AMA that telehealth has a promise to reduce inequities in healthcare. Um, but first, we need to make sure that policies are put in place that don't actually exacerbate um, inequities. And so we wanna make sure <clears throat> that there's there is, obviously there is, there is still work to be done to ensure equitable access to telehealth. So things like um, at the state level, the things that we're thinking about are increasing funding for telehealth infrastructure, including broadband access and internet connectivity. We also need to recognize that some patients don't have access to devices that have audiovisual capability or the digital, digital literacy to use them. And we need to support programs that provide digital literacy um, and also recognize that some patients are simply more comfortable accessing care on the phone. So again, some of the reasons why we're supporting audio only. Next slide, please. Um, moving on to licensure, we um, hear a lot about a licensure in telehealth and the AMA continues to support 
the notion that physicians must be licensed in the state where the patient is located. Um, yet we have recognized and, and lots of concerns raised by physicians who want to provide ongoing care to patients who may be in another state, whether it's for work or school and or extended vacation. In the past, <clears throat> excuse me, this in the past, this is often viewed as just a one-off kind of exception that wasn't used very often. Um, but as we anticipate kind of the mobility of society, this is gonna happen and, and, and happen more often, more permanent policies need to be put in place. So we encourage states to include a narrow exception to licensure for those types of scenarios where an out-of-state physician is providing care to a patient with whom they have an established patient-physician relationship, with whom they have a, had a previous in-person visit, and for care that is incident to an ongoing care plan or one that is being modified. We also encourage exceptions for things like physician-to-physician -physician consultations. <clears throat> um, the AMA encourages and continues to support the recognition of licensure across state lines through reciprocity or other means when certain safeguards are met. And we continue to support the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, which has been adopted in 33 states plus DC and Guam, <clears throat> as a mechanism for states to, um, I'm sorry, as a mechanism for physicians to be licensed in multiple states in which they would like to practice. Next slide, please. <clears throat> We've worked with about 20 states this year on telehealth legislation. We are always happy to work with um, state medical associations on reviewing proposed language. Um, we also have recently updated our model uh, telehealth legislation. And finally, we also have an issue brief, which underscores a lot of the items that I talked about today. And we also work um, hand in hand with lots of influential state level policymaking organizations on these issues as well, to try to get our voice um, kind of out there across, um, across, um, across the landscape at the state level. So with that, I will turn it over to Sandy. Thank you, Kim. If you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna to turn to the federal policy on telehealth. Um, as most of you probably know, this has really been driven in large part since 2020 by the continuing COVID-19 public health emergency. The public health emergency declarations are the responsibility of the HHS secretary who first declared the COVID-19 PHE in January of 2020 and has renewed it every 90 days since then. The current PHE will go until uh, mid-January. It was renewed on October 18th. So back in January of 2021, the then acting secretary of HHS sent a letter to the governors and said that HHS expected the PHE to remain in effect at least through 2021 and that HHS would provide states with at least 60 days notice if HHS planned to bring it to an end. Now, many of us have been thinking about the PHE as being very important for the provision of telehealth services under Medicare, but it also allows for a lot of the other federal policies that have been in place. The emergency use authorizations for vaccines and drugs that have been issued by the FDA, the continuity of Medicaid coverage without having to do eligibility redeterminations, these are all happening because of the PHE. So as we understand it, what HHS and CMS are currently working on is trying to develop a transition plan for how they'll be able to move into a post-PHE environment but we don't foresee the PHE ending anytime soon. It'll, it should continue well into 2022. Next slide, please. So everyone probably remembers this, but just to refresh your memory a little bit, before the PHE, Medicare only paid for telehealth services when they were provided in rural areas, when the patient went to a medical facility to obtain them from a distant site, when audio video telecommunications equipment was used that was HIPAA compliant and telehealth services were paid for at facility rates, not the same rates as, were, as physicians received for in office services, so about 30% less. And in addition, the Medicare telehealth list only had a very limited number of codes. Next slide. 
So during the PHE, Medicare has greatly expanded its coverage and payment for telehealth services. It's now available in rural and non-rural areas all over the country. It's available not only when it's provided to a patient at a medical facility or physician's office, but also when patients are in their homes. It can be done via smartphones or audio only telephones such as landlines. HIPAA compliance is not being enforced. It's now paid at the same rate as in-person physician office services, and telehealth has been available for a greatly expanded number of codes, including emergency department visits, home visits, the new hospital at home services under Medicare, and many types of therapy, PT, OT, and speech therapy. Next slide, please. So what's gonna happen after the PHE does end? Well, Congress has already enacted legislation that will maintain Medicare telehealth coverage throughout the country and for patients in their homes when it's for the diagnosis and treatment of mental health conditions or substance use disorders. Now, these services would continue to be covered anyway during the remainder of the PHE, but after the PHE ends, there's gonna be certain conditions for coverage of these services. And to make things a little more confusing because the mental health telehealth coverage and the substance use disorder telehealth coverage were passed in separate pieces of legislation, the conditions apply only to patients being treated for mental health conditions via telehealth, but not to those who are being treated for substance use disorders. So after the PHE ends, Medicare patients who are being treated for mental health conditions via telehealth will need to have an in-person visit with their physician within six months of their first telehealth visit. Next slide. Then, unless the physician and patient agree that the benefits of an in-person visit are outweighed by the risks and burdens associated with an in-person service, the Medicare patients being treated for mental health conditions will also need to have in-person visits within 12 months of their subsequent telehealth visits. CMS has also adopted policy that Medicare patients being treated for mental health or substance use disorders will permanently be able to access care through audio only telehealth services. And there's gonna be a modifier to designate those services. Similar policies have been put in place for opioid treatment programs. So patients who get services from OTPs can continue to access the counseling and therapy that OTP providers do via telehealth, including audio only after the PHE ends. Next slide, please. Now, what about other Medicare telehealth services after the PHE, those who are, who are not for mental health care or substance use disorder? Well, unless Congress acts, that's gonna pretty much return to the way it was before COVID. So whether or not Medicare patients who are not in rural areas can continue to receive telehealth services after the COVID-19 public health emergency depends 100% on congressional action. This is not up to CMS. Whether or not Medicare patients can continue to receive telehealth services in their homes instead of going to a medical facility after the PHE ends also is gonna depend 100% on Congress. CMS can't do that. So the AMA has been strongly advocating for passage of the Telehealth Modernization Act or the Connect for Health Act in order to keep these flexibilities in place permanently after the PHE ends. And you're welcome to join our Physician Grassroots Network. The link is provided on this slide, um, if you're not already a member of it, to help advocate for Congress to pass these, one of these two bills. Next slide, please. During the public health emergency, as I mentioned at the beginning, there were many services that were added to the Medicare telehealth list that had not previously been able to be provided by a telehealth. CMS put a number of these services into a category that it calls category three, 
which are services that are interim and will continue to be covered through the end of 2023, even if the public health emergency ends sooner. Now covered in the absence of congressional action means they would be covered for patients in rural areas, but still wouldn't be covered for everybody unless Congress acts. Um, AMA comments had advocated that certain other services that had been covered during the PHD also be included in category three, but CMS did not agree to those additions. Um, so as a result, Medicare is slated currently to discontinue paying for the three CPT codes for telephone visits when the PHE ends. Those won't continue through 2023. Coverage for initial hospital visits and for um, new patient nursing home visits also would end at that time. We've also been pushing for the Medicare program that provides hospital at home services to continue after the PHE, but their future remains somewhat unclear. Next slide, please. So what's next for federal telehealth policy is, is an issue that's being worked on in a number of different places, um, including several different federal agencies. Uh, CMS and HHS are considering how to manage the transition to post-PHE policies. The Drug Enforcement Administration and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration are examining future policies for substance use disorder treatment and for prescribing controlled substances. Um, through the PHE, people have been able, physicians have been able to prescribe uh, controlled substances based on telehealth visits, including audio only visits. They've been able to prescribe buprenorphine for substance use disorder treatment that way. Patients have been able to get some take home methadone. So all that's being worked on by those federal agencies. Um, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has been putting out uh, reports on telehealth and plans to issue a big report on the evidence from COVID-19 telehealth coverage during the, during the PHE. Um, the MedPAC, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission is providing recommendations to Congress on this issue. And the AMA, as I'm sure you've heard about, has developed its return on health framework, including case studies describing how physicians and, and organizations are best able to mix digitally enabled hybrid care with in-person virtual and remote monitoring services. So I think that's, yes. So Kim and I are happy to take your questions. Great, thanks Kim and Sandy. Um, we're gonna open the floor to any questions. Um, please feel free to use the reactions to raise your hand if you'd like to um, make a comment or question. And then Sandy, I'm not sure if you can see in the chat, but we've got just a couple of comments there. Um, I don't think that they're necessarily question. One from Lisa, it really doesn't make sense to require face-to-face -face visits. Um, the past two years has shown that, um, that patients don't need to unless there are certain circumstances. And then um, Samuel's asking about non-physician professionals in telemedicine. Um, it may seem somewhat rigid in, rigid in scope of practice considerations. Um, so not sure if you have any comments on either of those. Um, well, on the first one, the AMA totally agrees with you. We are trying to get that face-to-face -face visit requirement removed. They did make it somewhat more flexible. The, the requirement to have a face, an in-person, I should say, because you can be face-to-face -face on telehealth, but the requirement to have an in-person visit within six months of your first telehealth visit for a mental health condition came from the legislation passed by Congress. So CMS simply implemented that as it had been passed by Congress, they didn't change it. But the um, requirement to have additional in-person visits within 12 months of subsequent telehealth visits started out to be every six months and now has a um, an exception process. So that's what I described as if the, basically if the patient and the physician agree that having an in-person visit is not a good idea, they don't need to have it. The physician just needs to make a note of that in their medical record 
and they can go ahead and have the telehealth visits without the in-person visit. Yeah, and I'll, um, I have a question about the question that was asked on, on scope of practice. Are they, are they asking specifically about referring a patient to a non-physician professional across state lines? Or are they talking about the ability to supervise across state lines? And, and that is going to vary considerably by state. Um, so I think having a little bit more um, context there would be helpful, kind of what the question is. Yeah, and Samuel, if you'd like to unmute yourself and clarify, that would be awesome. Um, yeah, this is Samuel. I, uh, I, I'm i a cardiologist and we use uh, nurse practitioners and physicians assistants extensively in, within our state. And I guess my question is, can I have a heart failure patient in another state that may be seen by a nurse practitioner with my direct supervision if that's the, the state requires? But what do I have to actually have a license in that state or go to that state to visit a patient who may be getting primary supervision by my nurse practitioner? That's just one example, but that's that's kind of the gist of my question. Yeah, so good question. Well, well, the question of whether you need to be licensed in that state to supervise is going to really be very state dependent and we'll encourage you to reach out, not just to the state medical board um, in the state where you want to practice and then the state that you are currently in, but also your medical liability insurance carrier to make sure that that's um, permissible and covered um, by your liability insurance. Um, and again, it's gonna be very state specific, but I think that there are is some leniency in terms of the ability to supervise across state lines. And I think you're really gonna get into the questions of whether you need to be licensed in that state. Those are questions, of course, I would like the AMA to address and not avoid, as you just did, uh, because there are wide variations in state practice without naming the states. Some of them are extremely rigid and, and really are negative uh, to the practice of medicine, in a, particularly in areas that don't have a lot of physicians. And other states are quite good. This is a federal policy, and the AMA is avoiding it. All right, um, these questions are fairly lengthy, so I'm just gonna go down the line and see if you'd like to clarify. Um, Howard, would you like to ask your question live? I can see that if you want me to just address it. Sure, um, okay, that sounds good, Sandy. Yeah, we, we definitely have heard about this, this example. Um, we were, when we were commenting on earlier rules from CMS about its telehealth policies, um, when they, Initially, they were not going to put all the home visit codes in um, category three, so the coverage for those codes was going to end right when the PHE ended. And we were trying to find examples of where home visits needed to be available via telehealth and heard some examples, just as you've described, with people being in the patient's home, helping them with certain um, things with their activities of daily living or, or even helping the physician who's, who's on by telehealth being there with the patient. The same thing has occurred with the hospital admissions that have been able to be done by a telehealth. So there are staff at the hospital who are assisting the patient and are providing information to the physician who's at a distant site that allows the patient to get admitted to the hospital much more quickly than they could have if they had to wait for the physician to get back to the hospital from wherever they're located. So there's definitely examples of where this happens. Sanjay Bhatt, I can just read his question here. Um, for non-mental health providers, what are the criteria for in-person visits, any requirements post PHE, for example, gastroenterologists? Well, unfortunately, Congress hasn't yet passed legislation that's gonna extend telehealth coverage for other than mental health conditions and substance use disorder treatment beyond the PHE. So hopefully they won't have in-person requirements that go along with that whenever they do it. But um, at the moment, it's not even you know, covered except in rural areas, so. Kim, I think you covered this one, but the question here is, would you be able to comment on the regulations regarding telehealth being practiced across Oh, I'm sorry, country lines. Um, can Shins licensed in the United States provide telehealth services when traveling on extended vacations a broader example? For yeah, example. unfortunately, I, I don't have the answer to that question. Um, you know, we really focus on licensure within the United States. So um, 
my guess is you're going to run into a whole host of issues there. Um, and um, but but I don't have a an, a, an answer for for definite. Thanks, Kimmy. When I read when I read it originally, I thought it said state lines, but country <laughs> lines. So a <laughs> little bit little bit different there. <laughs> yeah. All right, from Gabriella. So does anyone know the future of telemedicine for medical visits or is it all still up to Congress if we go back to old ways? Yes. <laughs> to Congress, but you can help. You don't have to just, you know, leave it to the fates to decide. You can help. You can advocate to Congress that they do this. That's right. And I'll put that also, I'll drop that um, also in the chat here. So I'm just reading through these. Okay, from Amy, um, is the is that initial in-person visit for mental health um, person or clinic specific? If it's a therapist or LCSW, does an intake in-person intake can the patient follow up with a psychiatrist using telehealth? Um. My understanding, and I am, I am not actually the expert in this particular law, but um, my understanding is that if the health professional or physician is in the same practice as the person that the patient is seeing via telehealth, then their in-person visit counts for this purpose. I hope that helps. If they're in a completely different practice, then it's not going to count. It has to be have that kind of organizational relationship. Okay, next question from Nancy. Can you address the communication, technological based communication, which is perhaps meant to be a crossover? And there's several numbers here that might mean something to you, Sandy and Kim. Um, audio only calls under the PhD. The difference is that. CTBS G752 is not subject to the Medicare telehealth rule and may be a way to continue audio only post PHE. Yes, that is, sorry. <laughs> that, that code is still available for, I think they call it virtual check-in services. Um, it's the CPT codes for telephone visits that they're saying will end when the PHG ends, but the um, virtual check-in codes, and they have this new one that's longer than the other virtual check-in code that existed previously, those, those could still be used. They're not considered telehealth for some reason. They're, they're, just, they're just codes covered by CMS. Great. Um, Sharon's asking, would you be able to post the two bills in Congress that support telehealth so they can contact their representative? Um, oh, and it looks like, okay, so that link sh that, that you already provided should help with that. Because I know on the Physician Grassroots Network, there's a bunch of information about this telehealth advocacy, but if we need to send out more, we can. Sounds good. Um, Dr. Libby, did you have a question? You know, I will, I will just ask, and the question I had actually is, uh, are we networking with patients? Um, because as I perform more and more telemedicine visits, the demand goes up and up. And the uh, acceptance and actually the preference by many uh, for convenience, access, and and really the expertise that they're looking for has been to do more telemedicine visits. So it seems that, uh, you know, initially we had some feedback from large surveys on uh, patient preference, but there was a good, good endorsement by patients. And I just wonder if we're still doing that and if we have any uh, advocacy coming from the patient side. Uh, we also have a patient grassroots network. Um, I'm not sure if, if we've engaged that particular network on this, but you know, we've definitely been doing work with some patient groups, but I, I, sorry, I don't have, I don't have the answer to that right now, but we'll look into it. So question from Lisa, um, Kim, can you elaborate a little more about telemedicine companies like Teladoc, et cetera, 
There are many physicians that are using these as their employment. How do we navigate this well with the patient physician relationship? I think the direct to consumer model will only grow. Yeah, so, um, you know, AMA policy in our model bill and, and we continue, we see states, we see states um, including this in their legislation as well, that that patient physician relationship can absolutely be established via telehealth um, when appropriate. Um, and so I think that, you know, those those direct to consumer models kind of fit within that um, that caveat. And um, and and yeah, so I, I, I think that that we would that fits within kind of the language that we support and it's in our in our model bill. From Michael Cooper, um, if a physician is living with their partner in the UK but maintains their New York state license, can they continue to see patients who live in New York via telehealth? Yeah, again, I think these kind of, we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, across country lines here, would, I would need, I would encourage that they um, seek, um, seek uh, some, some guidance from a lawyer. Sounds great. Okay, um, I think that that is all the questions that we have from the group today. Kim and Sandy, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise on some of the, the changes in, in policy um, for the new year. Um, if there's any additional questions, feel free to continue to send in the chat and I'll make sure that they get over to send, can, Kim and Sandy um, after today's call. Thank you both so much. And then Thank Audrey, you. if we can go to the next slide. All right, so we're gonna move now into um, our practice spotlights. And our first practice spotlight today is Dr. Adrian Villarreal. Dr. Adrian Villarreal is a veteran of both the US Army and the US Air Force. He completed medical school at Western University of Health Sciences, College of Osteopathic Medicine of the Pacific in Pomona, California, and completed his residency training in both osteopathic family medicine and neuromuscular skeleton medicine at Nova Southeastern University in South Miami, Florida. Dr. Villarreal is the owner of his own practice, private telemedicine practice. He is licensed to practice in Florida, Michigan, and California, and has a temporary license in North Carolina for telehealth. In addition, he also serves as a chief medical officer for stay-at-home docs, an all-in-one telemedicine platform designed by Physicians for Physicians looking to launch their own telemedicine practices. Dr. Villarreal, it's an absolute pleasure to have you participating in the program. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Bernadette. I really appreciate that introduction. So hello, good afternoon and good evening. So Adrian Villarreal, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, uh, speak at today's presentation. I have a private practice in Miami, Florida. It's a cash payment. I have uh, insurance pending. So through a couple of a uh, couple of providers, Anthem and Medicare, Medicaid, and these these just take time. Uh, for those uh, who are not familiar, so, and then even for those who are familiar, these these are just time intensive uh, practices. My preferred patient population are veterans, uh, especially if they're minorities, but also first responders, police, uh, fire. Now, the virtual care modalities that, that I offer uh, through my practice, uh, video, phone, and even text messaging. So I, I usually employ primary and urgent care, so long as that's purely in the telehealth side. The way that things work um, with, with my practice is my, my patients reach out, they make an appointment online or express interest online. They're scheduled through my EMR, so, or through my Microsoft platform. They fill out the intake forms, the consent forms. We have the appointments and whatever treatment is necessary, if that can be over the phone, if that can be uh, education, guidance, referrals, if I can order labs or uh, radiology studies, uh, medications. So we'll, we'll make those happen and then we'll have them follow up as needed and to see how they do. Um, I've had uh, a lot of patients express a lot of satisfaction with being able to, to establish contact with a physician and to be able to get ongoing guidance and ongoing uh, visits with someone that, that understands what they are dealing with, has had a chance to get to know them a little bit, and has reached out and provided assistance 
even if they've never had a chance to meet me face-to-face. Uh, -face. So I think that this is going to be a tremendous opportunity you know, for not only uh, physicians to be able to, uh, to continue to practice um, how we want to take care of patients, but for patients to be able to receive care in ways that are, are very, very um, comfortable and easy for them to access. So, next slide, please. Um, going off of some of the early documentation in the AMA uh, telehealth playbook, the, the thing that stuck out to me as far as discussing the virtual uh, care value stream and health equity, the points of high access, high quality, with lower cost and high experience. Uh, I, am, I am a public facing practice. So uh, I will take, if, if you can find my website and make an appointment. So I will of course uh, be happy to see and treat you. The, the insurance uh, payments are coming, but for, for the moment I set up payment systems, uh, uh, payment setups and uh, accept cash uh, through Stripe and, um, uh, PayPal as well. Um, with the social determinants of health and you know, the patient population that, that I see, um, for some of them, so especially veterans, telemedicine may be the only option that they have. Yes, the VA has extensive outreach options, but a lot of, a lot of veterans, so they may choose to live in very rural areas. And yes, they may have a landline and they may have you know, a smartphone, but that might be it as far as what is the first option that they have for accessing care. So because the, the VA location nearest to them may be, may be, may be a trek and uh, the other civilian sector care may be even further. Um, as far as a, a clinical use case, um, the, the one that I would have for, for my own example would be um, a patient that I had for an entirely separate um, uh, set of circumstances continued to contact me for care and support of his own child when his child was admitted into a hospital. And there was a lot of questions that, that he had that he had directed to the child's care team and was not terribly satisfied with the answers, even though the care team gave him the correct answers. So he would text me and call me and he would say, what does this mean? And I had more than ample opportunity to be able to speak to him and to explain, breaking it down slowly, this is what that means. And it turned out it was exactly what the care team was saying, but I had the opportunity to pull it apart, calm him down and explain it in a way that he understood. It helped him feel better. It helped uh, his, his child relax and feel better. And I don't see this going away anytime soon. Um, the virtual care modality in and of itself, um, from the telephone to remote patient monitoring, um, I don't think that we want this to go away, just in terms of the virtual care value stream and all of, all of the aspects that, that we can see here, the clinical outcomes, we're seeing Im improved care, improved access to care. So the patient, family, and caregiver experience, when you're working with a telehealth patient, you know, it's almost guaranteed that there's going to be somebody there from their family, especially if you're working with a pediatric patient so, or another family member and being able to access that information and that additional information to be able to get the context. So to be able to understand the patient better is, is just invaluable, kind of leading to the clinician experience. So I feel confident in how I am able to care for my patient, the information that I'm getting, the information that I am expressing to uh, my patient, and so the, uh, the overall outcome for that. As far as the financial and operational impact, 
being able to, to be flexible with how you are able to interact with your patient is, is going to lead to increased financial um, opportunities and it will change the operational impact of how you see your patients, but I think it's going to be a win-win situation. So with my practice, um, a couple of things worth mentioning. Um, that some key telehealth accomplishments, um, getting my own state license, not just a medical license, but going through the Secretary of State and getting my own private business license, my own LLC. One of the things that came in very handy with understanding the, the nuts and bolts of keeping the lights on and keeping the income streams, you know, stable enough to point to where I can offer myself as a private practice and to keep and to keep things going. Um, the boots to business class that I was able to access through the Veterans Administration and through the Small Business Administration. One of the options, one of the necessities, excuse me, I misspoke, that uh, you must have as a small business owner is something called a bail team or bail IT team, something I had no idea about. So that, and, uh, that the bail team means your banker, your accountant, so insurance and your lawyer in IT information technology. You need to have your own EMR platform uh, set up, your information management. For me, I used Stay at Home Docs, uh, a company that uh, permits uh, docs to investigate and to set up their own virtual private practice. For me, a lot of the lessons learned from this process, um, I started, I started uh, my own LLC about a year ago. But uh, medical school is not business school. So, and there were a lot of things simply about you know, keeping a business going, keeping it stable, keeping it afloat that I did not get from medical school. And this boots to business class and the um, resources from the Small Business Administration and, and SCORE, the select core of retired entrepreneurs has, has been absolutely key. So to, to learning what I have to do and understanding what I should not do. I had the opportunity to kind of dabble in multiple telehealth platforms during the pandemic, or in the early stages of the pandemic. I uh, applied to uh, work through K-Health, um, um, Amwell, Teladoc, and I worked for the California State University in San Bernardino to offer telehealth services. In all of these uh, experiences, the one takeaway that I had from this was uh, the COVID-19 pandemic hit the least fortunate and the hardest. So the number of times that I've had patients calling in or texting in, as is the case with K-Health, saying, this is the only health care I can access right now. Um, that was practically every other patient. And so, and they, most of them were so thankful and so grateful that there was a physician on the other end of the line that was listening to them and doing their best to understand what's going on and to help them. So for my, my future priorities, I would like to focus uh, developing uh, further services on my key demographics, veterans, minority veterans, and first responders. I hope to be able to establish a hybrid practice. So some days in, in office where I can provide the osteopathic uh, manual treatment and other days to be able to focus on uh, telehealth. And to do all of that, I would need to hire other staff soon. Um, so goals for the future. So, uh, this has been my, my impression. So for the conversations that, that I've been a part of with the AMA uh, telehealth mini boot camp, things that have come up from the past, telehealth has been around for, the, for quite a while now. When we consider so the parameters that have been discussed here even today, but also with these bills in Congress, 
of having landline access only. We've had landline access in the United States, 1930s, 1940s. And so with regards to that, so we've had telehealth for quite a while in terms of, you know, other than the civilian population between, you know, the time in the military. And I knew as, as a medic in the army that we had to rely on the radio. So for communication and getting our patients the care that they need. So working as an EMT, when I was in college, uh, the radio was absolutely critical, especially with our other uh, first responder brethren, fire and police. Going into you know, further uh, telehealth examples between aviation and NASA, aerospace medicine is its own telehealth. So practice in certain regards. You know, aerospace medicine is also very much an in-person practice, but they do a lot of medicine over the phone and on the radio. So in my mind, telehealth has been around for quite some time. That's only going to get better. So next slide. This is my contact information. So that is my website. That is my practice phone number. That is my practice email. And I am on the team at Stay at Home Docs. I am their chief medical officer. And uh, that is the about uh, website where uh, you can see the entire team. So next slide. And whoa, that's all I got. Dr. Villarreal, thank you so much. We've got a qu couple of questions for you here that have come through the chat. Um, Sharon's asking, do you have any special malpractice coverage for telehealth? Is it more costly? I have um, a special writer for malpractice coverage. Um, my malpractice coverage um, is both through uh, the doctor's company for all, all the other states except California. And in California, it's the Cooperative of American Physicians. And the, the writer is on there specifically. It's not bad. It's really not bad. Great. Question from Samuel. Do you expect to receive Medicare and other insurance payments for telemedicine visits for payments neither you um, or your formal physician partner see, in, see the patient in person at any time? For, for certain aspects, yes. If, if, there, are, if there are things that, that can be addressed in, in a telehealth setting, so the, the example that I give is, is a UTI. Um, a lot of, I've had female patients who have gone to the pharmacy who have gotten the, the uh, test strips themselves. And you know they're there to buy the azo medication so they can start self-treating self for their signs and symptoms, but they'll get the test kit and the test strips themselves. And they'll take the test and it'll be positive and I'll get them uh, on the chat and they'll hold up the positive test strip. And she's like, doc, I have a urinary tract infection. It's like, can I get a prescription? Yes. Now, do I need to see them in person? I really don't. You know, will I, would I like to see them in person at some point? Sure, but um, so far there hasn't been a problem with reimbursement. Great. Question from David Cooper. Um, what do you see as the pros and cons for doctors in using platforms like Teladoc over how medicine is traditionally practiced slash trying to do it on your own? Uh, great question. Um, that, that's, a very, that's a very complex question. So the, the long and short of it is you're, you, you don't get the, uh, the, the, the subtle cues of how is this person sitting? What are they doing? What is their body language? So what, you know, what are, what are they bringing with nonverbal communication? You can kind of get some of that, but it's, it's not the same as being able to sit down and speak with somebody face to face. So there is also something uh, that is lost in not being able to have a, a physical connection. So with the patient. So the, the therapeutic touch, the therapeutic contact and conveying your, your intention to treat. So with your hands, that is something that is lost with telehealth. So 
that being said, your ability to be there for somebody, to let them know that you are present, you are listening, and you are there for them, that can be done with a telephone call. So, so not all is lost. So does it, does it take some getting used to? It really does. Is it for everybody? No, it's not. But the, the patients get the care that they are looking for. The providers get to develop a new aspect of their skill set. And I think everybody wins. Great. Um, we'll just take a number, one or two questions here. Um, Sanjay's asking, since you're a cash practice, what do you charge for texts and how much for visits? And if you're not willing to share, maybe just sharing just like generally how you maybe uh, determine your pricing. So, so for, for visits, I go, I, I kind of base things off of either the, the new or, or the older uh, Medicare, Medicaid, kind of the uh, 99210 or kind of general ballpark of, you know, this is, this is going to be take 15 minutes of my time. This is going to take 30 minutes of my time. And I charge accordingly for, for, for texts. It's going to be a little bit less uh, for video chats. It's a little bit more, but it also comes down to what, what is the market going to bear? And so, but, you know, sometimes it's, sometimes it has to be flexible. If the person is a veteran, I try to offer them discounts. If they're a first responder, I try to offer them discounts. Um, if they're gonna have trouble paying, I try to offer a payment plan. And so a lot of it comes, comes down to, you know, what can we work out? Um, Great, okay, we'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Villarreal. Really appreciate your time today and sharing um, just how telehealth is working at your organization. Um, our next practice spotlight, Audrey, if you'll go to the next slide, um, is Dr. David Welsh. Um, Dr. Welsh is a general surgeon in private practice and serves as the president for Surgical Associates of Southeastern Indiana. Outside of the practice, Dr. Welsh has been an active member in organized medicine. He currently serves as, the mem as a member of the Council on Science and Public Health at the AMA and, all, and also is a member of the American College Surgeons Board of Governors. Dr. Welsh, thank you so much for joining us. Glad to be here, thank you very much. Um, next slide, please. Nothing to disclose except that working in a rural setting is challenging and very uh, rewarding. Next slide. Telehealth in the rural setting, it, put it simply, it, it can be very complicated. And next slide. We need to use a quilt approach, uh, kind of like all of the above to, to try to reach as many patients in many settings as we can. I practice in Southeast Indiana. I go to three critical access hospitals as a general surgeon. I handle all sorts of, of things. Um, I'm in a rural setting, but not as rural as my colleagues from Wyoming and Montana that's on the, the call tonight. There's an old saying though in Southeast Indiana is a good place to live because things come slow here. So if the world comes to an end, it will take about 10 years to reach Batesville. When cell phones became popular, it took years for Southeast Indiana to catch up. That's why many people re remember me at the uh, HOD carrying both a beeper and a cell phone. A similar experience with technology such as telehealth has been my experience. That's why I, I suggest a, a quilt strategy, next slide please, has been needed to utilize telehealth in my community. Given the rural infrastructure, telehealth is not easy. Given the circumstance of COVID with patients afraid to come to healthcare facilities, as well as delays and leading to delays in testing and surgeries, but also putting off evaluation and treatment, making their subsequent treatment even more challenging or worse. Why is that? Next slide, please. In Southeast Indiana, along with other rural areas, we're experiencing inconsistent IT connection, connectivity. Many of this webcast who have seen me on Zoom calls uh, with me knows that sometimes it doesn't work and it gives out. And, and I live in a, in a work uh, and work in an area where the, there's better covered areas for as far as IT. There's also variability in patients' IT literacy and capabilities. Many do not ha have current or robust enough equipment 
to go on Zoom calls. They can exchange emails, but may not be, be able to take Zoom meetings. Equipment barriers, and, and many have con connectivity gaps. Um, there are a, a growing number of IT hotspots in my county, but it's slow and it's still very inadequate. And there's also safety and privacy concerns. Next slide, or stay with, stay with back to that slide, last slide. I'm sorry, if you can go back. Um, there's also variability in responses from insurers. In many cases, insurers would not cover the requirement um, re concerning payments. Early on, my visits were performed via phone and they weren't covered. In other cases, the insurer's checklist was followed and the result was uh, poor or denied coverage. Then there's the problem of secure modalities. If a patient had opportunities to, for remote access for telehealth visit, in many cases, the mode of communication is either wasn't secured or was high risk of being hacked. In some cases, the phones were used, um, if they were connected with the hospital, they can get encrypted messages back and forth. Um, we use that many times with the nursing homes, trying to get pictures of that wound when we weren't allowed in and out of the nursing homes very much. Um, in some cases, people use hotspots like at the local libraries, uh, but again, there were security issues. Um, and of course, most people's phones are not uh, encrypted. Next slide, please. But don't get me wrong, it has not been all gloom and doom. We have had um, good efforts and good successes. We've been able to connect high-risk patients to care earlier um, than if they waited for coming into the office. Telehealth helpless, de de in some cases, delays, uh, decreased delays in treatment. We also were able to decrease some travel time uh, because people didn't have to travel to the city. We used, they could use telehealth through our office to other doctor's offices. And they also got instructions about, did they really need to make that trip to the big city? Um, and they also helped decrease time to treatments. Um, help was obtained from younger tech savvy family members. They help patients get to hotspots off of phones and even off of GM cars. They helped set up laptops and homes and connect to the internet. We were able to also connect to our nursing home patients in the area the same way. We were able to connect through, through like I said, through libraries, through extra efforts, we were able to access patients to convince them to, that yes, they really needed to come in or they needed to get to the emergency department. Uh, we oftentimes made arrangements for them through the telehealth to come in when they did need to be seen and, and examined uh, firsthand to arrange for them to come when the office was empty or arrange for off hours in the emergency department. We, we had a lot of el older senior citizens in my area and they were uh, very concerned about getting COVID or something else. We reached the high risk, we're able to convince them that it, they could not afford to stay away. Uh, through remote connections, we were able to get patients to treatments sooner uh, through our local ED we, where we also use telehealth. The telehealth options also help convert my rural patients, connect my rural patients to specialists in the city for evaluation, advice, and treatments. It's hard for many to travel to Batesville if they're considered that's a big town, uh, let alone get to the city hours away. And telehealth helps get information to folks so they convince them that they really do need to come in or we do need to get them to the city for a, appropriate and essential treatments. Next slide. So how did we connect and with the quilt approach uh, in my Southeast Indiana rural setting? We used all of the above. We used the phone, we used the video, we used Zoom, we used text. Of course, not all these uh, modalities were paid, at least particularly not early on. It worked well for some groups and some populations. In the ICU, for instance, uh, if a hospitalist was overwhelmed at the local hospital, he can contact somebody else in his organization for advice. In the emergency department, we were able to connect patients with stroke specialists, neurologists in the city, as well as cardiologists. We were able to get pediatrics connected with the Children's Hospital in Cincinnati through um, telehealth when people were afraid or limited on their travel. 
they work well for some groups. Um, for instance, in the emergency department, we are connected with Christ Hospital for cardiology. We're connected with UC Hospital for uh, stroke and telehealth. We were able to use telehealth through the local hospital to those tertiary care hospitals to get people to the cath lab in an appropriate and, and fast time. We were able to get people initiated on their treatment for their strokes. Now, the payments were varied depending on insurers and the setups and a lot of different requirements. Um, pediatrics had a special connection because we connected telehealth to the schools. So while people were in the schools, it was felt to be safer and they could still see the pediatricians without having to get to their office where there was a lot of sick folks coming through. Mental health is another area of growth and much needed in our area was we do not have very good mental health coverage, but with the advent of telehealth, we were able to connect people faster and more effectively. Uh, the workflows depended on which location we were talking about. In my own office, the staff would do the intake ahead of time, and then we'd make arrangements for the times so that we could do the telehealth visit. In the emergency department, they had algorithm and flow between the local hospital and the tertiary care hospitals. With the schools, there were special algorithms, and we also had the added uh, positive effect of there was a school nurse there who could help with information and uh, student history and help get to the heart of the matter why they needed to see uh, the pediatrician. Next slide. So what is the future for rural in telehealth? First, we have to look at Will the elected officials step up? In cases, some cases money was allocated, but was it rolled out? Was it rolled out to the areas that really need it? A big question is how long will the money continue? There's concern about how long we're gonna to continue to get reimbursed whether it's from the government or insurers. Uh, it's a definite time saver for families. So it can, be, it can be 30 to 45 minutes to get to Batesville add an hour to get or more to get to the city, if they could see the specialist by telehealth, think of all that time saved. Um, and also time saved if somebody's using telehealth from a clinic at a, at a factory, they don't have to travel to the doctor's office and get, get tied up. Um, there's better access to the specialist, particularly for mental health. There's a bit other big questions is the cost and the uh, return on investment um, there's the questions was really uh, talked about earlier about licensure and about cross state lines, which is a local issue. Uh, the big another big question is um, how to deal with security and liability issues, encryptions, sign ins, and, and VIP. That's my contact information. There's a lot of, of good stuff being done. I just hope that we can have all, all of us can step up and advocate to our elected officials so that this continues so that we can bet, give better access to our patients and better access from the patients to the specialists, whether the specialists are local or in the tertiary center in the city. Are there questions? Next, next, next slide, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Welsh. Um, we do have a question and I'd like uh, to invite Joanne Klein to, to share that live. Yes, hi, I'm an infectious diseases doctor and I'm starting a practice in a rural setting where, you know, I can't be physically in both hospitals, but I find that I would have to rely a lot on the bedside nurse taking away um, from their time with the patient. What's your feedback on, you know, how, how much staffing is needed, you know, putting assistance and I'm not sure what the best type of assistant would be like a uh, a, a medical assistant or a PA or a nurse practitioner or just rely on the bedside nurse. It seems, um, you know, well, I don't want to take their time, but I also want a good, um, you know, interaction with the patient. Well, first, if you're an infectious disease physician and you're working with rural hospitals, first and foremost, they love you and they're going <laughs> to want to have you in their facility and helping. So I, I can guarantee you they will work with you. I would use the example of, of the stroke a connection I, I mentioned earlier with Christ Hospital um, or with UC Hospital. The neurologist, there's, a, there's a, basically an iPad on a, looks like a robot 
and they can actually ask questions of the patient. They can, um, the, the camera can be directed at different locations and they can do a quasi exam with the help of the nurse. Uh, nurse, a medical assistant, any of those could, could work very well in the rural setting. And I would guarantee you the hospitals are gonna to wanna to work with you so that you can help them because they're telling their community, you, you know what? We have an infectious disease specialist helping us at our hospital. So they're gonna to wanna to work with you. And I, I think you just need to fine tune it. So I think if you have just an iPad with a nurse, especially if, it's, if they're calling on you, they may be in their, their version of the ICU. And so it's probably a better, even better trained nurse who's working the ICU. Mm -hmm. and if, if you need it to, to be tweaked, I'm sure they'll be able to tweak it. So I, I think you're in the driver's seat, quite honestly. And if, if you were in my rural area, we would bend over backwards to help you and accommodate you for what your needs are. Sounds good. I do have good admin support. I guess I'm just hesitant to, to ask and uh, should... should uh have the you know please, the voice please to ask, ask please ask so that you can help these patients as as much as you possibly can thank you all right next question from michael kessler michael did you want to ask that live yeah sure i, I can ask uh, that live I, I guess my question is um you know when when you have a specialist you mentioned cardiology and, and uh, for stroke, uh, who you're getting services from, uh, presumably from a tertiary center, uh, who is kind of helping out in these cases in rural emergency departments, or I guess I would imagine uh, potentially even inpatient. How does how does billing work for that? I can't. I don't know all the ins and outs. I do know that they've they've been able to work some of that out. Um, with the with the hospitals calling somebody else in their group, they're able to work that within their own system. Um, the cardi, for instance, the cardiology group comes to my hospital, um, so they're they're they are tied into the hospital very closely. I don't know the the specifics. Um, if you reach out to me, I can um, with my contact information, I can try to find out more particulars for you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Welsh. Thank you, this has been a pleasure and I'm, I'm really excited about where things can go next, but please everyone contact your elected officials, state and, and national so that we can keep this ball rolling and get things better. Thank you. All right, Audrey, if you will go to the next slide for us. Next up, we have um, Dr. Corey Howard. Dr. Howard is board certified in both internal medicine and primary care and is the owner of Howard Health and Wellness in Naples, Florida. Dr. Howard has been in practice for more than 20 years and has held many roles in organized medicine. From 2018 to 2019, Dr. Howard served as president of the Florida Medical Association and today continues to serve on behalf of the F FMA as an AMA delegate. We are especially excited that Dr. Howard is able to join us today as he's one of our original participants in the Telehealth Initiative, a program that inspired us to continue offering support to physicians nationwide. Um, Dr. Howard, it's an absolute pleasure for you to, for, to have you joining us today. Um, I think maybe there's an issue with the slides. I'm not seeing them up here. Slides. All right, oh wait, that's right. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you very, very much. And uh, hello to everybody there, Corey Howard. A uh, couple of quick things. So actually board certified internal medicine, gastroenterology, anti-aging, functional regenerative medicine, went to cooking school, did an Ironman, wrote a fiction novel, all kinds of fun stuff. But uh, my practice is a very different than everything that you've heard so far. Uh, I actually have a yoga studio and a kitchen in my office, which I taught as part of lifestyle medicine. And so I have a, a hybrid concierge model. That means that uh, patients mostly are insured, some aren't, and, uh, and then I charge via a contractual arrangement a fee to actually be in my practice. I live in Naples, Florida, where that is probably much more the norm than a lot of other places around the country, and I do understand that. Uh, as far as uh, telemedicine goes, uh, you know, tele this particular platform that we are learning from tonight uh, really helped me change my entire perspective on, on how I approach telehealth and the boot camp that I did in, in addition to 
uh, to the playbook that's available really was uh, really was invaluable. And so in the beginning, it was it was hard. You know, what exactly do you do? Choosing vendors, how do you choose payments and that kind of stuff? Now it's quite a bit easier, soon to get a little bit harder when Congress maybe decides not to pay for anything other than mental health. So yes, we are fighting that tooth and nail. But at the present time, uh, I am seeing patients mostly in the office. I, I usually do about 20% or so of my patient population. Those aren't my slides, by the way. But 20% or so of my patient population, maybe a little bit more per day uh, on a telehealth platform. Uh, sometimes uh, I do it in the middle of the day. In, in the beginning, when we were starting off, it was like, you know, I should put all these at the end of the day because it'll be much easier. But, but basically, and, and this isn't not necessarily the kind of medicine everybody else practices, I basically only have two types of visits in my office. I see people for 30 minutes or an hour. That's it. Uh, maybe even longer if they really like talking. But I don't do much less than that. So I am able to fit uh, telehealth visits in, in that time slot. If I talk to them for 15 minutes, I code appropriately. If I talk to them for a full 30 minutes, I code appropriately. If it's a patient that's uh, fully concierge, well, there are no charges for any of the additional services. Uh, and that's kind of the direction that, uh, that I'm going. The, the one thing that I really learned is how to document uh, on the fly uh, during the encounter. And so I have a, a kind of a notepad in my, my platform that I use, which I then cut and paste back into the note. I, I basically still dictate notes um, using a, a Dragon system. Uh, which works fantastic for me. My notes are readable. They make sense and actually have some kind of real meaning to somebody who might read it uh, versus just a point and click kind of things. The, the patients greatly appreciate uh, telehealth encounters for what they're good for. They are definitely not good for anything. And I'm, you know, I may be in the minority, but I don't think telemedicine should be the only way that a patient gets seen. Uh, they, they are definitely... Uh, methodologies and ways and reasons why telehealth could be good. In my practice, it's very good for follow-up, medication renewals, uh, just touching bases, going over laboratory studies. You can do that on the phone as well. Better face-to-face -face, because I can pick up some metrics uh, along the way. But uh, the most important thing is I can document and put it in the chart and, uh, and then be done and move on with the, with the next one. Now, I could probably be using uh, e-visits a little bit more. I do get a lot of texts from patients and emails from patients. And I, I you know, I, I maybe use it, maybe don't, but it, it definitely is a tool. Again, if uh, Congress makes a decision not to pay for it in primary care, then, you know, we'll just have to keep pushing uh, so that it eventually can get paid for. I hope it does. If it doesn't, then you'll have to find a way to integrate it into your practice or, or go to a, a cash model, which I think patients will pay for. You know, I, I, I tried out Teladoc um, just to kind of see what that platform was like and what it was different. Somebody had mentioned something about Teladoc. I, I personally do not like Teladoc. I think Teladoc is, is uh, for, for patients, it might be good for doctors. They pay horribly. And uh, if, if that's what you're needing, then that's fine. But I couldn't see four to six or more patients per hour to make it worth my while. So I, I didn't really get into Teladoc, but what they do have is a very good platform on the metrics on how to follow through, how to look at stuff, how to you know, decide on medications. And, and I thought that that was a valuable experience uh, doing that, but I'm not gonna be uh, involved uh, long-term. Well, one of the things that early on, I thought I might do a little bit more of was remote patient monitoring. But honestly, my, my practice is focused on prevention. Uh, I've, I haven't had a patient admitted to the hospital for heart disease in over 10 years. I'm, I'm uh, dedicated to talking to them uh, and making sure that nutrition and fitness and sleep and stress management and other things are, are really at the top of their list. They know that's what I'm all about. I educate them on the physiology of stuff. And I, I need to do that live. I need to be drawing pictures. I need to be interacting with them. And for my population, it works. It's not for everybody. So I haven't really decided on remote patient monitoring, but a few patients in my practice could do it. I think it is an extremely valuable uh, tool for many other practices that, that are seeing larger volumes of patients that need 
the, the uh, input from those particular devices and they continue to get better and better and better. Uh, one of the things about uh, coding and e-visits and telehealth, um, I'm a little bit afraid of what's happening with Walgreens and uh, Village Medicine and, and how they're you know, basically going to have more clinics inside of these corporate settings. Maybe some people think that's great or not. I, I don't know if it's the best way to provide care, but it is a form of care. And sometimes some care is better than the best care. Um, but I think that is a, uh, another thing that we need to be looking at. Uh, you know, in the future, again, if, uh, if we can't get Congress to budge or if something happens where, you know, we can't get reimbursed or paid, which is a better term, uh, for the services that you provide, you know, then I'll probably just integrate it into my own costs that uh, I will charge back to the patient in a yearly fee. But that's not going to be the norm for everybody. So I, I think that if it's not, then people will, will, for the most part, pay or see the value in it. A lot of insurance carriers uh, are actually using platforms such as Teladoc. And, and the problem with that is that um, if you have a patient that is on that platform and you don't sign up as a Teladoc doc, they basically are going to tell you that you can't see your own patient via telehealth. So that's a real problem that we need to work out in Congress, too. And I'm sure that we've uh, we've had a little bit of discussion there. Uh, overall, it's been a very positive experience for me, for my patients and for what I'm doing uh, long term in my in my particular office. I did see something on online and, and uh, you know, you can take a look and see who wrote it. I kind of take offense to the term officist. Uh, I do not think that that is a term we should be promoting out there. I don't want to be an officist. There's nothing such as that in medicine. I think people who work in offices are still doctors and you can have different platforms. Uh, if you choose to be a telehealth provider, that's great. If not, uh, that's fine too. But I think that we should probably stay away from terminology that might be uh, putting people into a, a certain corner uh, versus what they really do, because you have so much more that you can do in private practice. I do want to say uh, thank you to the AMA uh, for uh, really this project. I was involved from the very beginning, attended all the sessions, uh, had some participation early as well, and it, it has been a, an extremely valuable experience. And for anybody that's listening or that is going to listen to this in a uh, recording, uh, I would say definitely uh, boot camp. Uh, make sure you go through the playbook and uh, download the, the metrics, talk to the uh, many people now who are uh, going to be able to assist and, uh, and do the very best that you can for the population that you can. And uh, that's about it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Howard. Any questions? Knocked him dead. What are your thoughts on telehealth and gastro? So, you know, I don't practice gastroenterology um, as a, as a uh, profession anymore because I do it all encompassing inside of what I do. You know, obviously for gastroenterology, when I use a gastroenterologist now, I mean, I just need endoscopy. Uh, I do most of the, the other stuff and management things that don't require procedures. So from that standpoint, you really can't do that, uh, you know, virtually quite yet, I guess. But uh, that's something to be determined. But GI has a lot of nuances that I think an interaction with the patient is uh, very valuable. It, nuances in abdominal pain, different kinds of problems inside of the belly. You know, what does gas and bloating really mean? And, and I, I just personally get a lot more out of it. And I think patients get a lot more out of it in the live setting. But that's not to say that a, a telehealth setting, if that's what's available, you know, can't be utilized uh, to its, its maximum potential. Great. All right. Um, that's all the questions we have. Thank you again, Dr. Howard. Really, really appreciate you joining us. Thanks. Um, and up next, um, well, I guess there's another question that maybe just came through. Would you explain a bit more the integration of concierge med with telehealth? So, well, I don't know if there's that much to explain. So basically, if you have a, uh, an agreement with the patient, you can put in there whatever services you are willing to provide and if there is any additional cost or not. Telehealth, I, I see as just part of the continuum of a, of a concierge practice. It's, it's better than a phone call, uh, better than a text message, and that interaction uh, you know, builds more rapport, I believe, with the patient than those other 
two dimensional platforms. Um, so I, I think it's it is something that you would most likely integrate if it's a, a hybrid patient, you know, where they're actually insured. You you kind of you would basically charge their insurance uh, along the way, and and they would know that up front. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Howard. Again, um, Audrey, if you can pull up the slides. Our next presenter um, also is uh, an ongoing participant and originally participated in the telehealth initiative. Um, Dr. Shaw is a family physician and a CMIO, CIO at Compass Medical, an independent provider organization in Southeast Massachusetts. Um, Dr. Shaw is actively involved in the healthcare technology space via many national and regional speaking engagements and collaboratives. He also leads the Greater Boston Chapter of the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs <laughs> and is the current president of the New England Med Association. Dr. Shaw, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, it was nice to uh, follow from Dr. Howard because I still remember, I think we did a video together earlier this year as part of the ongoing journey, which we began last year. And before I start my presentation, I wanna uh, express my sincere gratitude towards the AMA and Massachusetts Medical Society team uh, who has helped us uh, by the virtue of being of uh, being part of the CTI initiative? Uh, we were one of the lucky ones who had uh, a hold, um, hand holding from the beginning uh, because we were part of this uh, early adoption model in the fall of 2019, uh, and then when the pandemic hit, uh, we didn't have to uh, look for help. The help came to us, uh, so really appreciate that. Uh, so. Uh, my practice where I work as a family physician and a primary care, uh, uh, Compass Medical, we are about uh, six clinical sites between Boston and Providence. Uh, about 80,000 patients we take care of, uh, and we have roughly around 85 to 90 providers. 90% uh, of those providers are either family medicine or urgent care providers or behavioral health or internal medicine. Uh, we do have some subspecialty, including cardiology and uh, some other subspecialties, uh, about 500 different team members. And uh, one thing I would like to highlight, since the onset of the chronic care management program is when our true journey towards the connected care model started uh, back in 2015. Uh, but as of now, we offer multiple connected care services uh, or remote care services here. And as part of the telehealth, all of our providers either offers audio or video services, and some offer nursing home and in-person home visits also. Uh, we do chronic care management program, uh, remote patient monitoring program, transition of care management program, and a new program we launched late last fall, which is for ER uh, discharge, follow-up uh, virtual care check-in within 48 to 72 business hours. So the... One thing which I would like to highlight is uh, for us, as every one of the other uh, speakers uh, shared the various care delivery model, for us, it has always been about, uh, at least for the last 10 years, uh, uh, journey from volume to value. Uh, so when it comes to reimbursement, uh, being in Massachusetts, I consider uh, it's a unique uh, situation because uh, our state of emergency last year got extended and we have, I believe, two to three years of a runway while all the payers uh, not only have to provide the parity uh, for primary care and uh, behavioral health services, uh, but for us, the payment for fee-for-service doesn't appeal us. So we have been preparing for value-based medicine. We take these contracts today. Um, I can't tell you the exact number, but we participate in uh, Medicare MSSPE, uh, gearing towards direct contracting in future. Uh, we do ACO with commercial payers and uh, part of the Medicaid ACO as well. And that is part of the reason we have started with the purpose of reaching the patients between the office visits where we were not focusing before. And we built this virtual connected care management model. And part of that model is not just care managers and nurses and medical assistants. We have providers who are part of this department uh, and services, including nurse practitioners, PAs, and physicians. Um, including our chief medical officer who does clinical quality control and uh, uh, oversight. Uh, we provide multiple services uh, and I'll sh uh, share with you a couple of results. So uh, one of the key accomplishments uh, in 2020, 
which we are proud of. And uh, I reviewed this, I believe, earlier this year during the uh, AMA uh, daily recap. Uh, uh, before the pandemic, as you can see here, March, April 2020, before that, uh, we were not truly focused on post-hospital discharge uh, unless we received a fax or a document or some phone call or some form of reactive notification. What we did with the pandemic, as you can see, our volume of all visits types, including the TCM, went down significantly. And we partnered with a healthcare IT startup, uh, which provided us uh, ADT feeds, admission, discharge, and transfer feeds for all of our 80,000 patients. And suddenly we started to realize that we have 450 to 560 patients getting discharged from the hospital or inpatient setting who we are not capturing today more than 20%. So as of 2020, and we maintain this level of uh, utilization still, uh, as of today, we still capture 85% of our transition of care management eligible patients. And as you can see here, uh, before the pandemic, uh, we only did 15 to 20%. Um, and the only reason that number is 15 to 20% is uh, uh, we were reactive and now we are proactive. So as we started the journey in 2020, uh, in 2021, we started to uh, look at, okay, where else where we can truly work on reducing total medical expense. And what we found out that as we were looking at the TCM eligible population, we also had about 150 plus ER discharges happening weekly. And unfortunately, uh, we did not have a specific way of measuring what we did before uh, we launched the program for ER. We didn't have that visit type. We did not even have an ER discharge as a visit type um, before last fall. And this slide is hard to see, but if you focus on the green bar, uh, which you are seeing on the uh, right corner, that is the ER discharge program, which was launched in fall of last year at one site only. I don't have the slides from this year, but I'm pleased to report that last 12 months, uh, before the November 2020, when we launched this program, uh, we did about 200 ER discharge visits. And the only reason there is an asterisk there is because we don't have any ways to measure it. Uh, as we all say, you can only improve what you measure and we were not even measuring. So I cannot even tell you how much my performance was, uh, but based on what we did measure, it was 200. And now the same comparison for next 12 months, which is the running 12 months, 2,103 ER discharge visits. These are incrementally new visit types. So whether you are FIFA service or a value-based medicine, doesn't matter what the incentive is for your practice or your group. Uh, these are the discharge uh, from ER we started capturing and we are also capturing around 80% uh, of them. Or in addition to the annual wellness visit, which we have been doing around 80% for the last five years. And uh, I don't wanna go over detail of the value-based contracts and the uh, hospital readmission reductions, you know, out of the top 20 providers in readmission uh, rate, uh, four providers are from our practice, and it doesn't happen by uh, chance. As Dr. Howard mentioned, um, he hasn't had CHF patient readmission in the last 10 years. Like It doesn't happen by the virtue of chance. He is making a deliberate effort in creating a care model around that uh, clinical services which patient needs. Um, so with that, I think what we are focusing now on, next slide, we are focusing on the key challenges which we already all know uh, about the digital divide with patient is real. Our care team is variable. I have providers who do 80% of their visits telemedicine today to someone who will begrudgingly do a teleaudio visit because they just don't wanna continue telemedicine. Uh, so we do have a variety of providers throughout our uh, practice. Uh, one of the key component is there is no one size fits all. So in my practice as a family medicine, 40 to 60% of my visits are telemedicine uh, in primary care. But I had the advantage of entering back into primary care last year, August, after having a three years of hiatus doing the CMIO work and urgent care work. So I started my practice with uh, zero patients. And in the middle of the pandemic, in the area of uh, zip code, which is digitally not naive, 
uh, Quincy, mm -hmm. Massachusetts, uh, my practice exploded. And every single patient who came in knew, I have trained them from the beginning how to approach uh, from online access of care to sending me a message or me using Doximity to send them a secure text and no, getting the notification when they read the messages uh, to my medical assistant. It's been all from the beginning designed to cater my style of practice in medicine. That doesn't mean it works for my colleague at the site. But one thing which is key is if you do not have a cultural alignment within your team, and a leadership engagement ongoing, not just one time launching the project and call it a pilot and walk away. That happens a lot in healthcare. Uh, uh, healthcare processes are complex. It requires constant re-engineering. What worked yesterday doesn't mean it's gonna work tomorrow. If you do not like change, this is not the right industry. That's how we say culturally to every team members. And anyone in the team, including a courier who takes a blood sample from one side to the central lab has the opportunity to share the ideas. Doesn't mean we act on all the ideas, but you need to have a processes to cultivate those uh, engagements. And burnout is real. I have gone through it myself three times in my life. Uh, last five years, I'm proud to say that uh, never again. Uh, and I say this on the stage and uh, this is a sick care system. This is not a healthcare system. We do not, we wait for patients to be sick to provide the care. Uh, so let alone talking about taking care of our care teams, uh, we have a, a very reactive healthcare system compared to other developed countries. So we have a long way to go before digital health can truly create a value for care teams. But that is very important. You need to think of a care team, otherwise you're not gonna be able to take care of the patients. And lastly, what I would say is uh, what we are focusing on is taking all of the remote care services models and combining a data-driven approach to truly reduce total medical expense and not have a provider make a decision on what services and how to provide and whether I'm gonna get paid or not. If you as a clinician in the exam room, whether it is a physical or a virtual, uh, need something done for the patient, it needs to get done. As long as it is the right thing to do, which reduces total medical expense at a um, comparable quality to your peers and a decent experience. Uh, there is a value equation uh, you can achieve. Uh, you don't have to satisfy a patient to have a great experience. Sometimes you are going to do exactly what patient asks you not to do and still they can be um, receiving a high level experience care depending on what the interaction was. So uh, with that, I would say uh, we are doing remote patient monitoring. So Dr. Howard, I was looking forward to seeing your progress. So I think we should connect offline. We have about 800 plus patients in the remote patient monitoring now uh, uh, and hypertension, diabetes, uh, COPD are three different clinical conditions we focus on. Uh, but we are focusing on a high risk patients only. So the top 5% are the only one we focus on for these RPM programs because we don't want to be chasing the CPT codes and uh, generating unnecessary work. Uh, with that, I think next slide does not have my contact information, but I did put it into the chat. Uh, so feel free to um, reach out to me if I can answer anything. Thank you. Dr. Shaw, thank you so much for sharing just insights from a health system perspective. Um, we've got a couple of questions for you here from Paul. Um, how do you capture the requirements for an AWV um, height and weight during a virtual visit? And how have you addressed the divide that you mentioned? So uh, it's a great question. The annual wellness visit uh, via virtual health is not a model we are doing right now. So I apologize if I misled. The annual wellness visit is all done in person. Uh, we have created a team-based approach where the nurses or medical assistants are doing 90% of the intake before and uh, before the visit or during the visit. But virtual annual wellness visits are rarely done uh, for the reason for what you just mentioned, because getting the patients who are already having a digital divide to get the blood pressure reading done properly, because from a Medicare requirement, if I remember correctly, you have to observe patient, take the blood pressure and document that you saw the reading on the machine for it to be counted. It cannot be just a RPM machine doing the reading or patient telling you that's my blood pressure. Uh, so it's, it's um, not something we are encouraging right now. All right, um, for the purposes of time, um, any additional questions for Dr. Shaw, feel free to drop it in the chat. 
Um, and I'll go ahead and introduce our last uh, but not least speaker, Dr. Grayson Armstrong. Dr. Armstrong is an ophthalmologist currently practicing at Massachusetts Eye and Ear of Harvard Medical School, originally from Charlotte, North Carolina. Dr. Armstrong went to medical school at Brown University and obtained a master's of public health at Harvard, focusing on health policy. During master's, he traveled to the Middle East to work on Syrian refugee policy issues and noticed the need to bring eye care to those in resource poor settings, which sparked his interest in teleophthalmology. He then went on Hello. to an optim ophthalmology residency Hello. at Massachusetts Eye and Ear um, and served as the chief resident and director of a busy ocular trauma service. Interestingly, Dr. Armstrong created his own fellowship in ophthalmic telemedicine under the direction and leadership of those at Massachusetts Eye and Ear. Also of note, Dr. Armstrong served for two years on the board of trustees at the AMA, is the vice president of a state Schulte society, is the vice president of his county society, and is on the strategic planning committee of a state size society as well. Um, today, Dr. Armstrong is the medical director of the hospital's 24-7 Eye Emergency Room is implementing new models of telemedicine at his organization and is performing research to try and make telemedicine a reality in his field. Dr. Armstrong, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bernadette, for that amazing uh, intro. Um, and as she said, I'm Grayson Armstrong. I'm an ophthalmologist up here in Boston, and uh, I'm a telemedicine aficionado that happens to have chosen the field that's least prepared for telemedicine at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, but I'll get to that in just a second and how I'm trying to tackle that. But uh, first off, I just want to say that it's an honor to be here uh, on behalf of the AMA and everything that's being done here and everyone that's been speaking before me. You guys are really uh, the boots on the ground. You are the physicians, the practice leadership, and the health system staff that are actively implementing these models of care. You are, like I said, the boots on the ground that are operationalizing these models of care. Launching new telehealth programs, integrating technological advancements, educating patients on how to use telemedicine and technology, competing with a rapidly evolving market as new models evolve, and then trying to fit square technologies like EHRs into the round peg of new virtual telemedicine programs is a lot, especially while we're trying to take care of patients during an active pandemic. But somehow we're doing it. And even though it's exhausting, I do wanna give kudos to every single person on the call and the people that might watch this later on. Uh, so it is a little bit of ironic that in the year 2020, which you would think would be the ideal year for ophthalmologists, get it, 2020, uh, we had a, a year that went towards telemedicine wholeheartedly, and unfortunately, uh, we were very ill-prepared to do so. Uh, so maybe we can start, start sharing my slides here. All right. So uh, as we all know, in March of 2020, um, everything went wild. So uh, the WHO declared it a pandemic in March 11th. By the 15th, social distancing was recommended. And the American Academy of Ophthalmology published guidance just three days later to cease all non-emergent ophthalmic treatment. Next slide. As a result, every single subspecialty uh, across medicine saw a drop in outpatient visits. And you can see here that this equates to about a 60% reduction in uh, guaranteed or, or uh, outpatient visits as compared to prior years. Next slide. This also uh, went back to the uh, Medicare spending. And so about a 60% decline in Medicare spending was seen across the board during the first six months of 2020 as well. Next slide. Now, ophthalmology outpatient visits were actually the hardest hit of all of the subspecialties of medicine. You can see here that we fell by nearly 75% uh, during the first few weeks of the pandemic. And so we were really, really hard pressed to find alternatives to care. Next slide. This equated to a massive reduction in uh, spending for Medicare to ophthalmologists. We have an older population base, so this actually is pretty representative of our uh, major source of income here. And you can see that we had a nearly 30% decline in revenue from Medicare during the first six months of the pandemic, which equates to $766 million. Next. And you would think that ophthalmology would dive into telemedicine to make a living for ourselves, or at least to make sure that we could see our patients and provide the care that was needed for those in our communities. 
but we were actually the lowest utilizers of telehealth at the beginning of the pandemic and actually throughout all of 2020. You can see here that we were even below podiatry. I don't know how podiatry is doing a lot of their work remotely. You can probably look at feed, I guess, on video, but ophthalmology, you know, it averages out to essentially 0% of our visits were done via telemedicine. Next slide. So um, why is this? Uh, I think it got mixed up a little bit there, but um, there was a slide that was supposed to be in between, but basically, we have a, uh, a very exam heavy specialty and the exam has to be done up close and personal. And if you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the whistleblowers in China was actually an ophthalmologist who got COVID because his glaucoma patient had to be so close while we checked his eye pressure. So our field is very exam dependent and not a lot of our exam has been digitized. You know, we have pictures that can, or cameras that can take pictures of the back of an eyeball, but you don't really use a lot of technology to check eye pressure remotely or, or do dilated eye exams. Uh, but fortunately, I came into this uh, fellowship in teleophthalmology at the exact right moment during this pandemic, right when the research that was uh, looking into ophthalmic telemedicine was spiking. You can see here that in the year 2020, the publications that were related to ophthalmic telemedicine uh, skyrocketed. Next slide. And this is just showing how close we have to get for our exam and uh, how that doesn't really equate to this Zoom call looking at an eyeball in microscopic detail. Next. So, like I said, uh, I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time at an eye hospital that was willing to innovate. And so we had a lot of new models of care arise and I was able to take part in many of these. Uh, first, we did diabetic retinopathy screening. And so I think you can go to the next slide here. Diabetic retinopathy screening is probably the most well-known um, version of care. It's where, for telemedicine and ophthalmology, it's where you take a picture of the back of the eye and you can detect any changes due to diabetes um, and treat that remotely, get the patient in for care. Next slide. We've innovated in something called hybrid telemedicine. And I heard this spoken about earlier, so I'm glad this is actually catching on across all of medicine, where we're able to bring a patient in person, do their ophthalmic testing and send them home. And then later on, we do the virtual visit and go over the results. And in many cases, this is the exact same information we would have obtained in the office, aside from perhaps a slit lamp exam. And so we're able to digitally capture everything that we need to make a clinical diagnosis and management decision for a patient. Next slide. We've also used uh, virtual hotlines and virtual follow-ups to evaluate patients in our emergency room. I'm currently the medical director of the ophthalmic emergency room at Mass Eye and Ear, which serves all of New England, and we have a lot of patients. Uh, we're trying to find new ways to offload these patients from coming in, even now. And so this hotline, the patients can call and we can set up virtual visits to triage their symptoms to see if they truly need to come in person. And any patient that was seen in the ED that lives far away within the state that doesn't necessarily need to come back for an in-person exam, we're following up with them via telemedicine as well. Next slide. Now it quickly became apparent that in trying to set up these models of care, I was on board, but a lot of the physicians were really not ready for this. And so we created a formal telemedicine curriculum for the residents and physicians at the hospital on how to conduct high quality telemedicine exams in ophthalmology. And you can see here that part of it also focused on uh, health equity in the field of telemedicine, especially in the field of ophthalmology. Uh, one of the things that we have up here on the top of the slide is that, you know, uh, low vision patients probably have a hard time using Zoom and Duximity, right? But because the reimbursement was uh, geared towards video-based visits, the advocacy towards audio-only visits was actually incredibly important for the field of ophthalmology. And so this is something that we uh, really fought for and we're happy we'll hopefully continue to be funded. Next. We also looked retrospectively over the year 2020 at our hospital's volume in telemedicine versus inpatient visits. Uh, that's what's represented here. You can see the volume of telemedicine visits in blue and the volume of in-person visits in gray. This is from January to December, 2020. And uh, the results are actually quite striking. Now they're not equal numbers. They're, they're separate um, and uh, there are many more in-person visits than there were telemedicine any given month. Uh, but if you go forward one slide, the things that we found were fascinating. Uh, first off, telemedicine was used less often by patients who were older, were men, were non-English speakers, were, had an educational level of high school or less, and those who identified as Black. Go to the next one. And then we, we 
determined that the potential exacerbation of health inequalities through the use of ophthalmic telemedicine highlights the importance of focusing on equitable healthcare delivery through telemedicine in the future. Basically, we all talk about how telemedicine can improve patients' access to care and improve health disparities. We actually found that it actually it worsened it. And so now we're being more purposeful in how we employ and deliver telemedicine to our patients, making sure that it's available to all patients with interpreter services that are integrated uh, and for low vision patients like I talked about. Next slide. We're also trying to use um, research to prove that the care that we're providing is of good quality and actually does what we say it does. So we're putting together prospective clinical trials where we're providing the, the testing that we need for our ophthalmic uh, exams, such as macular degeneration or glaucoma. We're putting these in local community health centers scattered throughout the Boston area, nowhere near our eye hospital, uh, but in underserved communities specifically. And we're trying to get these patients the care they need closer to their homes and their own communities instead of bringing them all the way in to see us. And we think that this is gonna help them a lot. This, we think this is more appropriate and we think this is really the future of where telemedicine can make an impact in these communities. But we're also gonna find whether in this prospective trial, uh, the telemedicine is also going to be as effective as the in-person care. And this isn't only done in underserved communities, it's also randomized to um, patients that would otherwise come into our Boston office and live downtown. Next slide. Um, to try to make this, and the title is misleading here, but what I did want to highlight is that we're also trying to define what the quality metrics and outcomes are for telemedicine. No one has done this in the field of ophthalmology, and the work that the AMA has done in terms of quality and outcomes within, op, within telemedicine has been instrumental in helping us here. Basically, we want to publish data on what our benchmarks are for telemedicine use, the safety and efficacy of this, who's using it and why, and then share this with the world publicly so that we can share best results and best practices and learn from our peers and neighbors as well. Next slide. So overall, and I think we can actually stop sharing here, um, it's worth knowing that there are a few, basically uh, six key points that I wanted to highlight that I think we should all be mindful of moving forward with telemedicine. First, if you're on this call, you understand that you have to be flexible in the implementation of telemedicine and how you approach telemedicine. You have to be creative because ultimately digital health can replace any or all aspects of a clinical exam. You can literally use it just for the HPI check before the patient arrives while they're waiting in their car, or you can replace the entire clinical exam with telemedicine, but you have to use you know, an innovative mind to figure out what's appropriate for your patient population. So that's innovation. Number two, you have to train your doctors, your residents and your staff to appropriately use telemedicine. And in many cases, there aren't best practices. So the work of this group, the AMA, is vital in helping define and disseminate those best practices so that we're doing what's best for our patients. Number three, we need studies to show that telemedicine is clinically efficacious and safe. Without this, a lot of physicians are going to be naysayers and non-believers, and that's okay. You know, it's okay to be late to the game if you're scared about using it for your patients, but I do think that the onus is on us on this call to do the research to prove that we're providing safe and effective care for our patients. Number four, I think we need to ensure that we're improving health disparities and not worsening them with the use of telemedicine. Number five, we need to monitor meaningful outcomes with telemedicine use and track those benchmarks over time and make sure that we're sharing that with each other so that we can work together to come to a better future for telemedicine. And lastly, something that I didn't even touch on here because we haven't even started to tackle it yet, is we need to make sure that we're um, measuring which patients have access to telemedicine and the resources we need. And this is the digital divide that was talked about earlier, but this is critical. If we, have, if we don't know who in our patient population can use Zoom or Doximity or phone, if we don't know who has broadband access or not, then we're not gonna be serving our patients correctly. So we need to do a good job of making sure that we understand who we're serving and how best to reach them. We can't just assume that everyone has a cell phone in their pocket. And so overall, I do wanna thank the entire Mass Eye and Ear team, including our chair, Joan Miller, and all of the physicians and all of the uh, administrators that I've been working with literally daily to try to make these things a reality. It's been a year and a half plus in the making for these models of care, and it's still ongoing. We just this week relaunched the ED virtual follow-up clinic, and it just takes a lot of work. You know, there's a lot of pieces and a lot of moving parts. So I understand that everyone on this 
call is uh, going through that and nothing is easy. Um, and so as we face a growing and aging population, a large proportion of our patients will continue to need care, if not need it more so than ever. There's going to be a continued demand, therefore, for medical care. And as patients have now seen the value of telemedicine in their lives, I don't think that we can backtrack. They're going to be asking for it and expecting it, and we need to make sure that we're offering it to them in a way that's safe and efficacious. There's still a lot of work to be done in telehealth to reach its full potential, and all of us can play a small part in continuing to sustain or expand telehealth at our practices and advocating for future advances legislatively, regula uh, regulation-wise, and in our states and federally. And a lot of what the AMA is doing is pushing those boundaries. I'm really not going to belabor a lot of the other points that were brought up today, but the best practices that were shared are probably just the tip of the iceberg, and I look forward to the future of what these events hold. There continue to be many opportunities for the future beyond what we've talked about here. And so I just want you all to know that the work you're doing is incredibly important. And I want to thank you for all of your efforts to date and everything that's yet to come. Although a lot more work lies ahead and it's all worthwhile, I hope you're as excited as I am to be part of something this drastically uh, ground shaking and you know, earth shattering as it is uh, right now with telemedicine in our fields of medicine. Thank you. Dr. Armstrong, thank you so much. Um, great calls to action for everyone to take away from today's event. And thanks so much for highlighting telemedicine and, and innovations in ophthalmology and all of your leadership and spearheading adoption. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so this brings us to the end of our time together today. Um, just wanted to say again, yet another thank you to all of our speakers who have voluntarily shared their time with us. And um, thank you all um, for participating in the program this year. Uh, we wish you a happy holidays and um, we'll absolutely be in touch with more programming in the new year. Thank you all so much and have a great night.